I am Matthias Omotola, a.k.a. Major VFX on the interwebs. You might have seen me on many of the other 3D motion shows. We are here live in New York, accompanied by Brad Nichols. Bradley Nichols, who's our next presenter. We'll let him get started so he has the maximum amount of time. So let's Cheers, get man. going. Cheers. Cool. Uh, so, hey, thanks for coming. And then, you know, everyone that's joined the live stream, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, so, yeah, I'm Brad. I'm the head of CG at Pop Paper City. Um, so I oversee the 3D design pipeline as well as kind of assisting with 2D and quality control. Um, so just a quick bit about me. Um, so I live in Bournemouth in the UK. Has anyone been to the UK? Cool, nice, sweet. Um, so yeah, I live, live there in Bournemouth with my wife. Um, I've got two cats. I've got my dog, Bonnie. Um, and I have a little hamster called Steve, which is cool, cool guy, cool guy. Um, huge motorbike fanatic um, with the territory, obviously, massive gamer as well. Um, so I started my career studying photography, so I didn't really get into CG um, until a couple of years into my career. Um, so I was kind of working on corporate and short films as a um, camera operator and lighting artist, um, and then kind of quickly turned my eye towards motion graphics and 3D look dev. Um, kind of, I don't know, C4D gave me this like opportunity to experiment and create without the fear of making mistakes. There were so many times I'd come away from a shoot and be like, oh my god, did I leave the lens cap on or did I like even put an SD card in the camera? So kind of with Cinema 4D, any kind of mistake you make, you just hit control Z. Um, you know, and if there's any art direction that you need to do, it's super quick and easy to experiment. So it just kind of, yeah, naturally just ended up sticking with Cinema 4D and really u turning that career. Um, so for me, it was kind of awesome that Maxon and Pop Paper City from the beginning, we had a really strong partnership. Um, so it was a really cool opportunity to continue working on Cinema 4D and join a really, really cool show. Um, speaking of which, uh, the guys at the studio are definitely watching the stream. So, uh, hey guys. <laughs> um, so the show is pretty mad, but uh, it's the first ever long form kids TV show made in Cinema 4D. So no pressure <laughs> um, to, do, to do it well. Um, but it's built using the standalone Cinema 4D and Redshift that's available for everyone. So we're not adding any plugins or doing any kind of weird Python scripting to make it work for the show. It's, it's what's available for everyone um, on Max on One. So um, I think that's really cool that kind of what we're doing is just really standalone and core. Um, so yeah, with the, the show is basically it's a craft series with adventure. Um, it's the first, first series comprises of 52 episodes of 11 minutes. Um, which is basically nine and a half hours worth of content. Um, so all three Lord of the Rings is what we're making. Um, so the series are distributed by Ardman, uh, Ardman Studios. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of them, but they've done you know, Wallace and Gromit, Shaun the Sheep, uh, Chicken Run. Um, so big, big names. Um, our, so our anchor UK broadcaster is Paramount's Milkshake, which is on Channel 5 in the UK. Um, but we've also got many, many awesome international broadcasters that are supporting us all the way as well. Um, so the, the show is set in a really captivating and unique world. Um, yeah, so these guys are hitting the surf. Um, so it focuses on six paper crafted characters. So we've got Phoebe on the right, Plum and Zip on the left. Um, and then there's also um, Zip, May May and Fly. There's also a seventh character, which is a live action hand that comes down and helps them with the crafts. We'll, we'll get to him in a bit. Um, but yeah, the adventures are limitless, but they all begin in the capital city, which is Pop Paper City. Um, and they're finding new ways to have fun together. You know, they're going on cowboy adventures. They're going on pirate treasure hunts. We've just done an episode where they're going to space, which is insane. Um, and then they do absolutely everything else in between. Uh, so yeah, the kind of each episode features this uh, like a crafting element, um, and we want to be encouraging this kind of doing as well as viewing um, engagement with the audience. You know, we want to be inspiring kids to follow along with the craft, but also make the environments that are in the world as well. Um, so, you know, we're adding like little imperfections and folds to really make it feel like, hey, you could recreate this um, in real life. We actually have um, the city in our studio built all out of paper and we've got this in this like glass dome to kind of just keep us in that mindset. They're like, yeah, you can definitely replicate this. Um, so yeah, and uh, so with the, the help of our live action um, character helping hand, the gang will always craft something for their adventure um, in the episode. Um, so, you know, that can kind of range from like a, a camera um, for like Zip to go and take some photos of the gang. Um, and then, you know, to megaphones to like help the gang be like really boisterous and loud. So this one was actually in a um, like a performance um, setting. So, you know, we had Plom, who was the director and, you know, he was trying to trying to be overheard amongst the group. Um, and then, you know, we go on to bigger, really, really huge crafts. So we go underwater in a submarine. Um, we, we build paper dinosaurs. Uh, we did like a Jurassic Park kind of episode. Um, and then we build huge roller coasters as well, which was insane. Um, huge undertaking for the team, um, but such an awesome episode. 
Um, so anyway, I'll stop talking. Um, I'll get the get the trailer up so you can see it for yourselves. Why is it black? <laughs> Hold on. It's black on mine as well. Sit, sit tight. Hold on. Hey, there we go. <laughs> It's not moving. <laughs> OK. That's not worked. We'll throw that up in a bit. That's fine. That's fine. So yeah, this was the um, paper world that we've got in the in the studio. Um, so we, yeah, like I say, we've got this in this like little glass box. And it's kind of a, a constant reminder for the team. Um, but yeah, kind of so like casting our minds back to like we started the show back in 2019. Um, and Maxon's been just with us all the way, just supporting us um, through the development and just really getting to the show to where it is now. Um, and yeah, we've come a really long way. Um, but yeah, this is kind of why I'm here. I'm going to talk about how we're using Maxon and their tool sets um, to build the whole, the whole show. Um, so I'm just going to, yeah, let's just jump straight into Cinema 4D. Um, so, um, where were we? So yeah, I'm just going to start basically right at the very beginning of the pipeline. Um, I'll start with kind of a, just a look on kind of the world building aspect of the show and how we incorporate this um, kind of imperfections and stuff to make it feel like this is made of paper. And then we're going to just work our way through um, all of the different um, stages in our pipeline and all the different departments that uh, the scenes will flow through and just kind of some of the techniques that we're using within Cinema 4D just to make make the show possible, you know, including like um, consistency, looking at, at things to make scene speed really quick um, and keeping stuff efficient for the team. Um, so yeah, kind of the first, the th first thing to, to look at, um, got, this, got this nice little primitive cube, uh, always a place to start. So I'm just gonna kind of show a really quick and easy way to uh, make something feel like it's made of paper without having to go through and make, you know, a plane and then we're gonna you know fold it and make a 2d net and extrude some edges out so that we can actually make this real thing you know that that how you would make it in real life um just to kind of cut some corners and make it really quick so um what i'm going to do um for anyone that hasn't used cinema 4d before to drop the cube in um you've got this whole primitive section here you can drop a cube in just by grabbing that um so straight away can't really do anything with it um it's it's still kind of locked in as a as a primitive object so we're just going to hit c um, with it selected to make this editable um, and if we head up to the edges um, selection here i can now start grabbing stuff and pulling it around um, but this isn't really what i want to make a uh, a box work so what I'm going to do, if you right click on it, you get all of these um, different kind of modeling tools. Um, and kind of one thing that we use all the time, you know, to, to allow us to art direct some of the stuff we make, we will add the perfections in as like a final 10% of the thing. So we'll build, we'll build an asset, get it to kind of as close as we can, and then we'll start doing stuff like this. So um, for this, I'm just going to use the disconnect tool. Um, and what that's going to do is just going to disconnect this line that we've made um, and you have to select away from it because it's I've still got both of those edges selected so now I've clicked away hop onto there and I can kind of open this box out straight away um, so you know what we'll kind of do is you know we'll overlap like an edge like this just to add like this imperfection because you know what I think one of the the kind of core cool world building things we try and think of is if a kid was to make this box there's going to be you know weird weird glue smudges up the side of it there's going to be imperfections there's going to be weird little creases and folds um so that's the kind of thing we're trying to think of just you know we're not scientists making this little box you know we're we're, we're kids and we're applying our own little art style to it um so we're just going to overlap the edge there and then um, i'm going to do the same up here um, and just kind of get this box get this box looking cool um so disconnect that pop that bad boy up and then move it over here and then you know it's kind of now got this kind of overlapping um, feel you know it feels like it's made out of a net but uh, you know we can go a step further with that and use the cut tool so if you hit k on the keyboard um, it'll bring up these um, different different cutting tools but if you go k and k again you'll get the line cut tool um, so if i now add this little cut here 
sling it on over there. Um, and I've now got this little cut there, so I can just go ahead and grab like one of the points. And you can be really kind of like quick and dirty with this, and you can get a result really, really quickly. Um, but you know, I've got this box that a kid's made, and it just you know it doesn't look like a CG artist has made it, and they've painstakingly gone in and made it scientifically perfect. You know, it's it's just really haphazard, and it's like thrown together. And that's kind of what we're trying to do is is instead of approach this from a CG artist mindset, we're approaching it as though a kid is going to make this thing. Um, so yeah, adding like purposeful imperfections is one of the big things we're doing. Um, so cool, that's kind of just the design, the design element of it. Um, this this one's is pretty is 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 it's pretty boring this bit, but um, it's a really important start to the production is to have a really consistent starting point. Um, so to kind of run through, just because of my background in camera operating, when I would go out on a shoot, I wouldn't have an infinite amount of lenses. I would probably have three in a box, and I would choose only from them. So. It, and I do this at work, I do it on my own projects at home, um, I will always start with a kit of lenses that is a, re a realistic kit. You know, I won't take a 27.8mm uh, lens that just doesn't exist in the real world. I'll start with this, which just means that, you know, when I'm, when I'm just look deving and I'm trying to get myself to, you know, quickly 80% of the way there, I can just jump between these cameras because they, they'll spawn in for me. And I'll show you how to build that scene so it spawns in straight away. Um, but you know, now I can just very quickly select these out. I don't have to make them. And it's something you, in every scene, you're going to have to make a camera. So why not cut that corner and have them always spawn in as a, as a beginning? Um, and it just saves, you know, when you're, when you're doing it on like, you know, single base projects, you know, it just makes sense not to, not to put in. But because we're doing this, uh, you know, week by week, we're on a new episode, we're opening new scenes every day. You know, you multiply those 20 seconds it takes to make that camera, you've suddenly lost hours of time. So to have that just begin um, straight at the beginning is awesome. Um, so, you know, we, we basically, how we've set this up, um, it's just a bunch of nulls um, that I've put together in a scene. I've matched that out in my layers, um, and that's really important when we get to the layout department, because um, that's how we'll organize it, and you can turn different bits off, um, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so basically, all, I, all I've done for this is just add in a null, It'll spawn in with the default name, the default um, default uh, logo for it. Um, so then you can just go into the icon, go load preset, and it'll just have a bunch there. I've just chosen some random ones, but for me, I find having a visual is so much quicker to find something in in the name. You know, I know all of this group here belongs to props because it's got the little guy there. <laughs> There's no reason for it. It's just, it's just a, a nice little logo to be there for it. Um, and it's the same for everything else. Um, so it's just having some kind of consistency to the scene. So as you pass this scene along to, you know, we've got like 40 different artists in the studio. So as you pass this from, from artist to artist, you have this consistency. Everyone knows where to find what they need. Um, so basically to set this up, um, it's come in as default for me. Um, and at the risk of ruining this for the next person i'm not going to click <laughs> i'm not going to click to save default because this might trip someone out um but basically now i've got this made i can go up to window and uh go to customization and go save as default scene um and then now every time i open um a new project it's going to just spawn those in to begin with so yeah it's just cut it's just cutting out that initial like technical step where you've got to make your nulls and it's, it just skips that boring process out because it's like hey it's already there and i spent you know 10 minutes doing it right at the start of at the start of production um so yeah mo moving moving swiftly on um so something that we kind of do to get us 80 percent of the way there you know like when you're building an environment out you want to flesh it out as quickly as possible because you know adding a bunch you know hundreds of trees there, you know, it's very difficult to be like a, a, a pure artist about that because you're just distributing loads of trees. The artistry kind of comes in at that final 20% where you're now just tweaking the composition to make that work. Um, so there's some tricks that you can do to get to that. Um, and the, one, of the, one of the really big things as well is when you're starting out, you want to be making your scene quick. Um, so what we kind of do um, on our show is we basically we build the environment out that environment goes to layout, and then it gets distributed like a hundred times for how many shots there are on the episode. So if you've kind of got one, if you've made your environment and it's super heavy, 
you've now just made a hundred problems for someone else to solve. So it's really important to spend that time when you're building your environment to make it as fast and as efficient as possible. Um, so there's some tricks that you can do to do that. Um, and this is something I do with absolutely anything. I don't know if you guys use like Quixel or anything. Um, so you, like when you're dropping those in, they're huge assets. So this is a really cool way of working with those, um, working with those assets. And we do it on the show as well. Um, so basically what I like to do uh, so you can already see I've got my instances in here, um, but I'm just going to hide those for now just so we can start. But let's say, you know, I've dropped in my asset pack here um, and I've got all the things I need for this scene. Um, and we, we use the asset library, uh, which is just over here. So we've got kind of a bunch of bunch of cool different stuff in, uh, in here. Um, I don't know where it's gone. I'm not going to try and find it in the interest of time. But um, yeah, we'll pull everything from the asset library into the scene. And this is a really cool place. And, you know, I could now Technically, I could, I could go in and I could start grabbing this tree and throwing it around or loving it in a cloner, um, which is fine. But when you do that like a hundred times or a thousand times, your scene is going to get really, really heavy. Um, so there's a really cool way of doing, doing this. So I'll, you know, I'll drop this in and then basically what I'll do um, with this kind of tree selected, I'll go in and I'll make an instance of it. Um, straight away, the instance is just, it's not going to give you any speed bonus. It's kind of just a... A, a copy of it, but it's a copy that you can't um, select any of the. So, like with the uh, with the snowy pine tree here, I could go in in the viewport and just grab this, and then I've accidentally moved some of the geometry around. So you'd have to select this null. Whereas the um, the instance, I can't do that. I can only select the the base object and move it around. Um, with an instance, you can use it with um, like any of the deformers. You can bend it. You know, you can do anything with it. Um, but in this case, we don't want to. We just want to distribute it across the scene. Um, so for speed, you can then just change this to render instance. And I can now you know, duplicate this tree like hundreds, hundreds of times and throw it around. Um, so this is a really cool way. You know, if, you've, if you've then got this set up, let me go to a, a here's one I've made earlier. Um, bring these all back. Um, so now basically I've, made, I've gone and made an instance of all of the objects that I'd spawned in. So now I can kind of go in and really quickly just start grabbing stuff and throwing it around as, as quickly as I like. Um, and I know it's going to be quick, so I can be really kind of really fast and just work my way through it without worrying about, oh, am I going to damage the scene if I've like thrown all these trees around? I just know it's going to work because it's set to render instance. And it's render instance is kind of like just voodoo to me. I don't quite understand the technical behind it. Whoever made it is a genius. Um, but essentially, it's kind of like saying, hey, look, I've, I've got this bit of geometry here. Load that in and then just reference it over here. And all, all this is is just letting me know it's a copy of it somewhere else here. You've loaded it in once rather than duplicates of it. You know, if you just duplicate it, it's, the machine's got to load it in and work out all the geometry and where it is. It just cuts that out and it just loads it in once um, effectively. I've probably butchered the explanation of that, but that's how I work it out in my head. Um, so cool, that's kind of like the instance mode. Um, so yeah, what basically just to summarize, bring in all your geometry, change it over to an instance, and then just hide that geometry. You don't need to worry about it, and then the instances of it become the thing you actually work with in the scene. Um, and then you can go into things like cloners. So I've got this scene here. It's kind of you know a little path, and the character's going to like run around. So I need to distribute this with trees. So we've got to do this quick. I want to get you know 80% of the way there. You know when when you're on a like a 52 episode show, turnaround is really quick. So you know you don't really have too long to spend on each scene. You know when we're working, um, you know the animators will have like a week and a half to animate a whole episode. So the environment team have probably you know, a few days to do multiple environments. So you want to get to 80% as quickly as possible. Um, so there's a couple of ways you can do it. So one would be using a cloner. So um, with this path, it's made just using a sweep. Um, so I can grab the spline from that sweep um, and use that as kind of my base to um, control the cloner with. So if I just make a duplicate up here, um, throw that up there, and then I'm just going to drag it just over here just so I know I'm using kind of the edge of the path. Um, and then I can just make a cloner, uh, oh, just make a cloner, which is just here, change that to an object mode and drag the spline into the object here. Um, and then if I just go ahead and drop in my snowy pine tree, and there we go. We've got a load of snowy pine trees. They're pretty uniform, but I can, you know, I can go ahead and, and make loads of these now. Um, I can set this to render instance as well again, just to really double down. Um, you know, I've had a thousand trees, 
looks great. <laughs> but it's still really quick. You know, I can fly around this scene really fast, and I've got a thousand of these trees. Looks horrendous. It looks like old school Windows when like the the screen crashes. Um, so let's you know let's just throw like fifty of those in there. That still looks horrendous. <laughs> oh, I'll, 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 fine. I'll go fifteen. Fine. Um, so you know it, it looks pretty uniform. So it's not it's not what we would want. But you can use then um, some other stuff. So like we could use like a random. Um, you throw that into the effector, and the random's just just going to basically randomly distribute it based on noise. Um, so then I can just go ahead and control this. I can throw some rotation in there. So, you know, get these spinning round. Oh, not like that. Wee. Sorry, the uh, whack on pen just rolled across the thing and just <laughs> my mouse just disappeared. Um, that's what I'll blame it on. Cool. Right. We're back. We're back. So uh, in the parameters, so I can just change this to, you know, maybe like three on here. Um, dial this up just to get some rotation there and then go three here. And you can do the scale as well. We'll do uniform, otherwise it will like start stretching it and doing really weird things with it. So we'll go like 0.4. Oh, maybe, maybe that was too much. But yeah, still, you kind of get the point that uh, you know this is it's moving these around in a really random way. And then you know you could layer up these cloners, um, you know, and start kind of copying them around and moving them. Um, you'd have to move, you'd have to duplicate the spline and stuff and move, move that around. And you know you could you could do do all that sort of stuff with it. Um, and it's really quick. Um, so, you know, that was, I've just put a row of trees in there within seconds, really, less than a minute. Um, the other one, which is like my favorite, um, they added it in like R24, I think, but it's the, um, it's the scatter pen. Um, and we use this so, so much. Um, I'm going to do the other side of the path with the scatter pen. Um, but basically, um, it's kind of like painting your geometry onto a scene. So it's really just intuitive and just a really quick way to just load up, load up your paintbrush and throw stuff around. So, um, Let's have a look here. So um, on, on here, you can go kind of selection, which is it will just read anything that's selected in your, your object manager and then paint that. I prefer to use the object palette just because then I know I've loaded it. I've, I've made a conscious decision to load that thing in there, and I don't accidentally just <laughs> distribute something I really don't want to do. Um, so if I drag this back in here, I'll make a duplicate of that. Uh, cool. And drop that into here, and then I can go and you know start dropping in like rocks, and I'll put a bush in there. Why not? Um, and kind of you'll see if I do do this, it's kind of just putting it on this really straight line, um, and it's very kind of yeah, just very uniform. Um, you know, it's just going to follow this line, um, which isn't kind of what we want. I want like clusters of stuff just so it feels random, uh, in the same way that it would with the random scatter in um, the cloner. So what you can do with that is basically make your um, brush size huge. So if you make your radius really, really big um, and your object spacing, you'll see the kind of like a bounding box that that's going to give. Um, and it's to kind of protect you from it clipping into each other. But I know that the tree, you know, I don't need a bounding box bigger than the bark because as long as my assets aren't going to be tall enough to go into the leaves of the tree, then that's fine. Um, so, you know, you can then just start painting this stuff in here. Why is that not displaying? Here we go, edit mode. Um, you can start kind of painting this here, and it's making little clusters that are really random. Um, that, you know, for like just painting like background stuff, it's awesome um, for just getting kind of some background detail in really, really quickly. Um, and then what I love about it is, you know, this is, doesn't look amazing, but, um, you know, this is, a really good way to get like 80% of the way there really, really quickly. And then we can start kind of bringing the artistry into it and getting some composition there. So if we then wanted to edit this, you can just hit C on the scatter pen and you'll see straight away, everything is a render instance. So it's scattering render instances everywhere. So you know it's really quick. Um, but then I can now start grabbing all of my geometry and moving it around. You know, if I want to bring this tree in here, or you know, maybe I want this tree as like a little foreground asset just to block the block the path off. Straight away, we can start bringing that artistry in. We've got all of the assets in the scene where we need them to be, and we can start moving them around. So it's a really quick way to kind of get you 80% of the way there, and then you can then apply yourself as an artist on that final 20%, which is where you really want to be, like finishing it off. Um, so cool. That's the asset distribution. Um, this is like a top tip one. Let's say you've just got a scene uh, that someone else has done and they've not followed that and it's and it's so slow and I, I've, I've had this personally and I've had to go through and try and line this up and it was it was horrendous and such a painful thing um, 
and you know, sure, you could you could make a you could make an instance of this, and you could you know painstakingly go in and line it up by hand and and match the rotation, and yeah, you know, you'll be there for like 20 days doing one scene. Um, what I like to do, um, you can do so. You have to kind of set it up in a way to be able to do it. So it's basically using a constraint tool to quickly snap things in place. Um, if you do it, you know, this way, um, you know, you'd have to go, okay, I'm going to go right click and go to rigging, and then I'm going to click constraint, and then, you know, I'm going to go to transform, I'm going to click that, and then I'm going to go here, and then I'm going to go and select that. And already that's like five steps. I'm there all day. Um, what you can do, though, which I, I think is awesome, um, you can go to customization and customize your palettes. You see straight away it's kind of highlighted all of these kind of areas up here, um, and that's that's your palette. So then if I go ahead and just type in uh, transform, there you go. We've got my transform constraint. You just drop that up there. And now uh, what I can do, if I make like nine copies of this, oh hello, if I make nine copies of this, I've got them all loaded up. And now all I've got to do is click the thing I want to move, and then click the thing I want it to move to, holding Control. So I'm selecting them both in that order. Otherwise you'll snap them to the wrong thing. So um, yeah, the thing you want to move, the thing you want to move it to, and then just hit the button and it moves. So then you can really quickly just start flowing through. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go through and do all of it just to, just to prove this works and the speed. And I think I've got my maths wrong. If you're doing it more carefully, you'll probably be able to track this um, a bit easier. But then if I go ahead and just delete it all, I've now got all my instances, and I did it in seconds rather than hours of painstakingly moving it. And it's all matched the rotation. As when you're transform constraining it, it's going to take all of the coordinates into, fa into factor. So now you've snapped it all the, the rotation matches, and you've just moved through that really quickly. And now I've just saved the scene. I can render it now. Um, so when I did this before, there was hundreds of these. So it, it got me through it within an hour. And we was actually able to render the scene. Um, so yeah, it's it's perfect. You know, if you're in a situation where you can't just rebuild it, it would take too long, and you just need to update the geometry. This is a really really cool trick. Um, cool. So now we're moving on to layout. So we've made our environment. Um, <laughs> this is such a cheat. This is such a here's one I've made earlier. Um, this took a lot longer than <laughs> than the previous two scenes. Um, but yeah, cool. So we're in this like underground cave, um, which is really awesome. And we're basically prepping it for animation. And one thing I don't want to do is separate the environment away from the scene for us to load back in later. You know, I want the animators to have the full context without having to ask anyone in, in the department. So what we're using now is, um, is the, the layer manager. Um, so basically what I've got going on, um, I'll, show, I'll just show you really quickly how, how this all works. So, you know, if I, because um, I've got everything in this uh, in this render layer in render, I can just solo it. You know, I can hide it um, and get rid of it. So, what we kind of want to be doing when we're delivering to animation is just providing them only with the assets that they need. Um, so, you know, with uh, with with this scene, um, you know, we just want to let them know, hey, there's a little edge. There's an edge here. Don't walk the characters off the edge and and let them plummet. And uh, you know, there's a there's a little there's a wall here where our character's already ducking underneath it because she needs to. You know, we don't want like a Star Wars stormtrooper thing going on where it just hits the head and she 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 collapses. So, you know, we want to just provide them with that information and that's it. You know, we don't want to give them the whole scene. We want to be able to turn the whole scene off um, and just give them the the kind of a scene with the least weight possible. Um, so, really quickly, how you can do that um, is so there's a really cool tip um, for just getting around your scene really quickly, which I just just did there. So in the viewport, um, you can just click on the asset that you need. Um, and if you have your like mouse in the viewport and just hit S, it's going to frame that object up in your viewport. But if you have your mouse hovered in the object manager and hit S, it's going to take you immediately to that geometry, um, which is a great tip for just getting around in the scene, because otherwise I'll be there like scrolling for days. Um, so I'm just going to copy and paste this, because um, this is this top bit of the cave, and the bottom bit is the, the only two bits of geometry I need. But I don't want to just pull it out. I want to. I want to make a duplicate of it so I can put it in the proxy layer. So if we just copy that, and then we'll do the same under here, and find that. And when you copy and paste anything, it just throws it straight to the top of the object manager. So I know it's. I know it's sitting up there, nice and safe. Um, and then I'm just going to drag this into the proxy layer. And again, it's just all about just making sure that 
everything I'm putting is in the right place so that when animation get it, they're not like, where, where is it? I can't find anything I need. Um, you know, because I, I don't want them lighting the pitchforks and coming after me. Um, so yeah, and now I've got this in kind of in the proxy manager. I can just hide. I can just hide the render layer. I don't need this anymore. Um, and you'll see, actually, if I just bring up in the project, uh, sorry, in the viewport manager, and go into HUD. Just go into frames a second. Um, so you can see we're like getting nine. It's jumping around, but if I play this back, we're getting like two. Two frames a second. It's really solid. Solid, solid game FPS. Um, but if I hide this uh, completely, so if I just hide these two, I've just, all I've done is hidden it from the viewport. It's still two. So, you know, what, why? Like, it's gone. Basically, in the background, all of these other layers, it's still calculating those. So um, it's still calculating the animation. And we have a waterfall in the background, which is like super heavy. We don't need it. So we, if we turn this off, you know, you'll notice there's got a little bit of speed back. We're now at 3.5. Yes. Um, and with all of it off, playback, we're now at 5. So we're, we're kind of increasing it slowly. All of the characters are obviously animating, so that's going to add a weight to it as well. So if I actually just soloed um, the proxy layer, so there was no animation, this is what we're looking at. We're going to 80. So that's pretty good. So you know, when, when you're in a scene where there's only one character and you're playing that animation back, you're going to get that speed there. You know, and I, I could just solo, like, just fly. Um, one character's playing at 32 FPS. So it's pretty good. You know, we've, we've got that speed back from turning all of these layers off. But you know, if I if I didn't turn from a, from A to X, you know, the, that's the animation, your um, like cloners and stuff, and any Python scripting and stuff that's running in the background. We've now just told it, hey, stop thinking about it. I don't want you to think about it. Just stop it. Um, so that's kind of what we're done. Um, so you, we, you know, we can make this lighter as well. You know, you could just go in and just like we we can do this really quick and dirty. Um, but you know, you could just grab this and just, just select a bunch of stuff. And just be like, hey, I don't want you. Bye. Because <laughs> um, basically, like, all I want is characters to walk down this line here and stop there. So you know, I can I can start stripping this back. You know, if you've got a bigger scene than this, where the characters are really traveling quite far, like we have an episode where they're in like race cars, which is really cool. But <laughs> to do that, you know, you need a massive environment. So your proxy layer is huge as well. So we kind of start stripping it back and be like, hey, well, they're only going to turn left here so we actually don't need this path that goes along here and we only we don't need anything that goes behind it we just need this little bank turn so you can kind of start being really calculated with how you do it but in this case i'm still getting 30 fps so it doesn't really matter um so yeah that's kind of just the layer manager um just basically it's just about getting some speed out of it so that you know when you're animating you can just really quickly select these back on and get the full context of like oh, okay there's like you know when they come out here what have they got to look at? Like, what? How can I make my act, my characters perform? You've got this like waterfall over there. Could they could they walk out and have a look at the waterfall? It just kind of like helps um, inform the animators um, without them having to like without an environment artist having to like render out a full 360 of the environment. You know, it just allows them to really immerse themselves in it a little bit more. Um, and then you know, when it comes to like sharing it with the team, you can share it with a full environment in there rather than just this like weird abstract platform that they're stood on and like you know the directors just got to figure out. Where are they? Um, so yeah, it just makes it a lot easier um, to kind of get around. So yeah, that's the kind of the layer manager. So that's that's all we're kind of doing at layout. Really, that's just like a really good way to just get efficiently there um, is just use those layers. Um, so on to, on to, on to my favorite bit um, is lighting. So again, just mostly here today to talk about getting fifty percent of the way there. Sorry, eighty percent of the way there. Um, so there's a really cool thing that I've kind of set up with. Uh, the area lights to get sunlight, but have it in a way that's controllable. Um, the main kind of uh, mission was to be able to have a consistent intensity of the sunlight, so we wasn't having to dial it in. I wanted to have um, so with the area lights, uh, you have like loads of different ways. Oh, hello! Um, I'm just going to turn that to quick shading. Um, so you have a load of different ways of like calculating it. So like image is um, it's scale based, so the bigger your area light, the brighter it's going to be. So you're just constantly having to battle that and like change the intensity to kind of get it to the exposure that you want. So uh, the kind of mission that I, that I wanted is, is I wanted a consistent intensity and I wanted my light to basically be there to control the direction of light and the quality of the shadows, like how soft or how hard the shadows were. 
So um, with this, um, kind of what I found, um, if you just made like this area right here, I'm going to throw it up quite far away, and I'm just going to make it absolutely massive um, so it kind of matches the sun. Um, but you know, the sun's not that close, which would be terrifying if it was. Um, so yeah, so we've got this, got this going on here. Um, and what I kind of, so with the show, I wanted basically, uh, as like a look, I wanted these cool shadows that roll off to like warmer kind of edges to the shadow. Um, it's a technique that um, the, I think it was the Secret Life of Pets used. Um, so kind of, you know, big, big name that uses this. So I'm like, cool, I'll throw that out there. Um, so cool, I've got this kind of bigger area light that's a little bit softer, and then I've got my smaller area light that's a little bit harder. So with this one, I'm just going to call this Hard Sun. Which sounds really tough. And then Soft Sun. Um, so really cool thing with Cinema 4D, if you have like two assets that are the exact same, you can just have them both selected and then input the, the parameters that they will use. So first thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to change this to luminous power um, because that's just always going to be a consistent output. It's not based on the scale. It's just based on the output of luminance that's coming from the light. And then I'm going to turn off the decay, which is a really rogue move. I don't want any decay purely because from, you know, in relation to the sun to Earth, there is no decay. It's not measurable because it's measurable by like galaxies. <laughs> so, you know, I don't, I don't want any decay because it's not realistic to the sun, um, which now means basically this is going to be way too powerful. Um, so I'm going to turn that down to like 12 because, you know, 100 with no decay is just is going to be outrageous. <laughs> so, you know, 12, 12 kind of gets me to where I need to be. Um, and then really quick, I'm going to do, I'm going to use my, my constraint, call, uh, constraint tool trick because, again, if I had this in a, uh, in a null, a um, really quick way to make a null, you can just select them both and do Alt G and it just makes, groups them all up. Um, so if I just call this sun. Um, the kind of downside to doing it just this way is I could accidentally select this light and just throw it back there and then I've just ruined my whole rig. So to really back myself up from doing that, um, I'll parent the soft sun to the hard. So just again, use the constraint tool and then all moves around. Um, and another, another really cool trick, actually I use this a lot as well, um, for especially for lights, um, just so I'm not like, here it's really hard to, to kind of tell in relation where this sun is, especially when it gets further and further away because we're going to chuck it really far back. Um, you can use the camera um, and actually use the object as the camera. Um, so with this selected, I can kind of use that. And now I'm in the view of the sun. Um, so I can, I can throw this around and move it. Um, and this is where my sun will be. So now if I go and render this, um, I'll kind of show you. what this light is doing. Give this a sec to cook. Cool, so um, looks horrible, looks nasty. It's really, 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 really hard shadows. But, and like note the intensity. So now if I throw this all the way in, shadows are softer, the intensity is the same. So now you can start swinging this light around and really art direct this scene with pretty it's pretty like fluid you know you can just cut start throwing this around do whatever you want with it um and again just with the 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 mindset of getting 80 percent of the way there i've got my main key light source you know when the characters are outdoors our main key is always the sun so now i can direct where that key light is coming from and the quality of the shadows with such ease you know it's so simple to do and it's so quick um you know i'm getting a readout display really really quickly so now I've got this, I can then start kind of, again, as a lighting artist, throwing my artistry into it and start adding some different area lights to, you know, shape the character up, shape the environment up. But, you know, it's, it, again, it's just about getting as quick as there as quickly as possible. Um, and especially using this, um, using the camera as the sun is, uh, you know, it's so good because now I'm just flying around. Yo. No, so... Um, Great question. So, um, sorry, what's your name? Corey. Jordan. Um, so, yeah, Jordan's just asked basically um, how how we how we rig that light up. So, basically, it's it's just a setting in the um, in the camera. Um, so, as you go into use camera, there's a there's a tab which is selected object as camera, um, which is kind of the set. You know, we're not we're not using an actual camera. It's the same as the default camera. It's not it's not 
tangible and real in the scene. Um, it's just you know a, it's just a view for it. But that view will move that camera around. So it's not we've not constrained anything to it. We've just kind of said, hey, what I'm viewing in the viewport is the angle of the sun, and as I move it around, it will move it with me. Um, I hope that makes sense. But yeah, so and and you know, it's it's really important to remember to uh, then switch back to default camera. Uh, I've done it, it pr pretty much every day. I do this, so I'm saying remember it, but you won't because I I never do. Um, so you know, I'll I'll do it, and then I'll suddenly zoom into the character, and be like, oh, what's what's going on over there? And then suddenly my lighting changes. I'm like, oh, cool, cool, cheers. Um, so cool. That's 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 some lighting stuff. Um, so. Yeah, finally, um, this is the kind of fin final scene for me. Just this, the final final department is rendering, um, and yeah, this is just about using some AOVs to determine where the noise is living, um, really quickly um, without having to, you know, study study the image and and de detect where the noise is coming from. This just tells you without having to have any knowledge on where noise is because well, I'm not a technician. I don't know where that is. Um, so with my Redshift settings all set up. Um, I'm just going to jump straight into the render view. Cool. So we got some pumpkins, um, which is super on brand. Um, it's you know since it's since it's fall uh, and Halloween is coming, so we've got a load of noise. Um, it's it's pretty horrendous. Let me let me bucket render just here. Um, doesn't look very good. I wouldn't deliver that. I'm not happy with that. So um, at the minute, we've just got a beauty pass. That's all we've got. So what you can do, if you jump into your render settings and go to Redshift AOV, jump into your AOV manager, and then you've got a bunch of these settings. Um, they're all really cool. They're great for like delivering to comp if you're going to then take this into After Effects or Nuke. Um, it's a really cool way of using it. Um, but you can also use it in the render view. So if I just go and drop in uh, my diffuse lighting, I'm going to drop in global illumination. Throw reflections in, why not? Um, and then just render this again. It's going to look the exact same. It's going to be no difference. But now, I can switch between these. So I can see what my lights are doing. So they have a ton of noise. Um, looks horrible. My GI, even worse. Reflections is fine. It's not that bad. Yeah, it's a little bit, little bit noisy, but there's not that much reflections going on anyway, so it's fine. So now I know that my GI is bad, my diffuse lighting is bad. I'm going to focus on those. Um, and this is a really cool way to just get some speed out your render as well, because my you'll note that my samples minimum and maximum are just four and sixteen. It's not that high. I think before I knew this, I would just crank these to the max and be like, "Cool, I'll just sleep," and then when I wake up, I'll have a frame. Um, but this is just a really cool way of just doing it a lot quicker. So now I can use my overrides. I know that my diffuse lighting looks like that, so I can just tick this um, and just replace these samples. So I'm just going to throw like five sixteen. Call that a day. And then go to my GI, because I know that that is also not very good. Um, and do the same here, just throw 516 here. And then we'll just chuck it again, see what happens. Uh, and this will only work if you bucket render, by the way. So if you do progressive rendering, you won't get that kind of readout. Um, so cool, much less noisy. Um, so in the diffuse lighting, it's looking pretty soft now. Um, and then in my GI, still a little bit noisy. Um, so you know, we could crank this up some more. We could, you know, um, uh, one of the really cool things. I'm terrible at maths, um, but you can do maths in in the prompt. So I've times it by four, and I've done. I didn't have to work that out in my head because I'd be here for the next hour trying to figure that one out. Um, so cool. That's kind of cleaning that up a little bit. You see, like straight away, we're losing some noise here. Um, and then how's our how's our diffuse lighting looking? That's a little bit of noise in there, so we can. This machine's really quick. This is really fast. When I tried, when I was testing this at home, I was just like, "This is taking forever. <laughs> I'm going to need to like really like speed through this to get to this part." Cool. So that's looking looking loads better um, on our on our beauty. And then we can use, you know, like on the show, we use denoiser all the time, and we're using it with animation. So like. I know it works because it's not it's not going crazy. It just has a hard time sometimes with like hard edges, but it works great. So if I denoise this as well, we're just going to get. Uh, I'm just using the optics denoiser in in uh, Redshift. Um, so it's just yeah, it's denoising it in the render engine. Um, and it's doing a pretty good job. That looks really really nice. Um, I mean we're only what are we at 720p so you know it's not it's not it's not epic but you know that's, that's looking pretty good and um, you know we got there in what like 5 minutes like so just basically using those AOVs to 
inform your decision on where you're going to put those samples. You know, and I've not I've not touched the minimum and maximum once. It's just remained at the default. I've not needed to because I'm just assigning these samples exactly where they need to go. Um, and that's what the AOVs are for, is just to tell you, hey, look, you've got a really noisy global illumination here, but everything else is fine. So just chuck some noise there and we'll be fine. So it's just Redshift kind of letting you know, like, this is what you need to do. Um, so cool, that's kind of the, that's the whole pipeline. Um, and again, you know, the whole kind of aim from this is just to get you always just 80% of the way there really quickly. Because when you're doing a long form show, you've just, you've got to be, you've got to be quick. You've got to get the results nice and quick, but you've also got to do the best job that you can. So getting yourself um, to that 80%, so then you can kind of apply your artistry um, on that final 20% rather than going all the way from 10% upwards and just being, an, uh, you know, really like art directing all the way. You're just getting yourself there and then you're like, oh, cool. 80% actually looks pretty nice. What a happy accident. And then you can call it a day or, you know, you can start tweaking. Um, any, any questions from you guys? All right. Bradley Nichols. We do have some questions. We have some questions. We do have time for questions if you're going to take them. Cool. I wanted, wanted you to try and open Premiere and see if we can play the video. That would be great. Just because yeah. we missed that. That would be we awesome. That. So see if we can uh, find a way to go ahead and play that. Failing that, I do have a backup, yeah. um, which would be fine as well. Yeah, we'll, we'll try it. But let's see what that I think happens. I think it's just the size um, of it. I think VL, VL, even VLC is struggling. Is, that, is um, that what it was? Yeah, I think so. I was like... It was probably it was like it was in a, some type of British format, it was like it was in PAL or something. Just <laughs> it's just the editors playing a prank on me. They're like, "Oh, this would be so funny if we yeah. just made it black." Yeah, that's it. It runs. Uh, but Jay, you had a question. I did. Well, I, have, I have so many questions. But Great. I guess one of my questions is, how is your team set up? Like, how do you guys share the workload? Like, how many riggers? I guess. Like, cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the question is, how is your company set up for rigging the whole pipeline? Who's doing what? How many on each team? Yeah. yeah. So um, obviously we started in 2019. So we had a lot of time to rig the characters ahead of time. Um, and those are our like main characters. So we it was all just rigged in house. We didn't have like a rigging team. We just had the director and some of the other artists that were there like building those rigs to begin with. But going forward with like environments and animations, so we have a um, so we have a layout team that will do the cameras and and build the um, kind of efficiency of the of the scene. We've got two modeling artists um, who are just cranking out new props every day um, and an environment artist who is you know taking those um, taking those models and building these like awesome landscapes he's just actually finished um, one of the space environments as well which just looks really cool um, and then you know that then moves to uh, animation we've got 30 animators um, two different teams that are tackling um, like two episodes at the same time then that will go, we've got a small lighting team, just two lighting artists, um, and then it gets passed on to a bigger team of render artists who are just sending that to the farm every day and just making sure it's quick and efficient so we're not jamming up the farm, it's just sending it through every day. Um, so kind of, yeah, that's how the team team is configured. I hope that answers your question. Uh, I think there's just under 40 of us. Um, so yeah, big, big team, and that's, that's in the studio. We've you know, got um, script writers and stuff, and, and storyboarders are outside of the studio as well. So yeah, we're big, big team, big team. Um, Solid team. Cool, let's go ahead and open up these videos, see yeah. what we can do here. Uh, go with a classic untitled project name. Well, hey. Uh, what's the shortcut to, to full frame this? I'm not gonna tell you. Good. good enough. That's good enough. We'll we'll take we'll take that. We'll take that. Uh oh, it's <laughs> the playback's a little bit weird. <laughs> uh let me do you know what? If you guys have two seconds, I'm going to grab my drive if that's okay and I can plug in MP4. Drive. We got two yeah. seconds. Cool, let's go. We'll keep, keep them entertained. So while he does that, everybody can log into the 3D Motion Show because we're giving away a Dell laptop as well as a Sense Lab tablet. And that's next week. If you haven't registered, do that now. Get your badge scanned. 
Also, coming up next is uh, Z Summit. So that's going to be the second week of uh, November. So if you guys haven't checked out ZBrush and all the amazing sculpting that's being done with it, Z Summit is a multi-day event showcasing both competitions as well as techniques used by some of the world's best digital sculptors. So you're going to want to check that out. We have events going on all the time. One of the things to check out is maxon.net forward slash events and you'll see all the different events. So all the 3D motion shows, upcoming events, um, ZBrush Live is on there, Ask the Trainer, which is a weekly series. So if you guys want to have questions, you want to get more engaged, that's the way to go. And let's see cool, if, this, if this did a thing. Uh-oh, here we go. Make it together. Well done, everyone. Ooh. Thank you, grown up. Paper lantern, periscope, umbrella, guitar, pressure chair, binoculars, buzzers, ground, basket, lighthouse, birthday cake, snowman. Now our snowman just needs a nose. Oh. Cool. Let's hear another round of applause for Brad Thanks, Nichols. Guys. Awesome. Stay tuned, everyone. We're going to be up with our next presenter, John Lepore, so you're not going to want to miss that. So stay tuned. We'll be up in the next five minutes or so. So hang out. Thanks again. Great job.